faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, Jerry Moon here and welcome to the Better Humanology Podcast. Today on the show we have Dr. Zach Long. He's a physical therapist and pretty much a genius. You'll see what I mean when we hop into the conversation with Dr. Long. But he, like I said, he's a physical therapist, so we're obviously going to talk about the human body, movement, and some things of that nature. But I think the biggest nugget you're going to get out of this one, uh, it's what I did, was all of the information he spills on blood flow restriction training. Uh, he talks about different studies with it being used with Air Force operators and the the amazing increases they saw in aerobic endurance, which blew my mind. But also what it's most popular for is growing your biceps, growing your your muscles uh, at these, uh, you know, unprecedented rates. This uh, this new new style of training, should I say, uh, is gaining a lot of traction. He gives the why it works and how it got started. It's it's a lot of great stuff. So definitely, if you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say blood flow restriction training, listen to this episode from beginning to end. You're really, really going to enjoy it. All right, before we hop into the show, I want to let you in on a little celebration we're having here at EO3HQ. So we recently passed a huge milestone, over 10,000 books of my book, The Garage Gym Athlete, have you know, gone out all around the world, different garages, pretty much on every continent. Uh, pretty awesome to see. And so what we're doing, if you can cover the shipping of the book, it's a small shipping fee. We're going to send you the book and also give you a bunch of uh, resources inside of our membership area. And so you're getting the book cheaper than you can actually get it on Amazon or anywhere else. And we're giving you a bunch of bonuses at Into 3 Fitness. And so if you want to be a part of that, you want to, you want me to ship you a book ASAP, then go to garagegymbook.com, uh, enter in your shipping address, cover that small shipping fee, and I'm going to send the book to you, like I said, as soon as humanly possible. Uh, we've been shipping a lot of orders. Uh, we just announced this on Friday, and a lot of people have been taking us up on it. So if you're interested, go to garagegymbook.com, get your book, get some bonuses. But other than that, guys, here is Dr. Zach Long. All right, Zach, I'm super pumped to have you on the Better Humanology podcast, man. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. All right, man. We like to get started by giving our listeners some challenges to kick off their week, and I'm going to give that, I'm going to hand that baton over to you. So let's start with a fitness challenge for all the listeners this week. All right. Uh, being a physical therapist, um, I'm going to not go with like a, a full body difficult fitness challenge. But what I am going to challenge people to is an exercise called the reach, roll, and lift. Um, if they go to my website, they can search for that and see a picture. It's a little hard to describe in person, but it's one of those exercises that looks really, really easy. But for a lot of people that are even big and strong, it's, it's quite humbling and will show you just how weak some of your upper back muscles are. And I think, I think any athlete that's doing serious strength training should be able to do 20 of these unbroken with proper form. And if you can do 20 of those, then in my book, you're going to have you know very low risk of having any shoulder injuries anytime soon. All right, so that's so re reach, roll, and lift for 20 reps. Reach, roll, and lift. For, I'm going to have to try that today. I love the little, little challenge like that, man. That's awesome. Yeah, I wish I could describe it, but uh, it's just a little too difficult to describe without a video. Yeah, and I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes where everyone can, uh, anyone listening, make sure you go to, uh, you can either search on his site or go to n3fitness.com and I'll just link straight to his site where you guys can, can check that out. All right, man, how about a uh, mental toughness challenge? All right, I'm really big on uh, identifying strengths and weaknesses and then planning according to that. So if your goal is, uh, like a lot of your guys, to just be generally overall more fit, harder to kill, and you want to be a little bit stronger, have more endurance, et cetera, break that out. What's your weak point there? Are you somebody that can squat 500 pounds, but you can't run a mile sub 10 minutes? Then guess what you need to focus on a little bit more? Or if your goal is to, uh, is to bench press 300 pounds in the next year, what muscle group or what area of the bench press is holding you back and then plan according to that. 
So if you know you have a strong chest, but your triceps are weak, then figure out a way to program with added tricep work or tricep emphasis. Or if you struggle at a certain point of the lift, then start adding in some isometrics at that portion of the lift to strengthen you in that specific range. But figure out what your weaknesses are in relationship to your goals and then plan an all-out assault on your weaknesses. All right, perfect, man. I love that. All right, how about a book recommendation? Uh, My favorite book of all time is Raving Fans by Ken Blanchard. Anybody that, that deals with people in your line of work should check that book out. It's a really easy read. And what do you like most about that book? Just that it shifts your your mindset a little bit more towards thinking of ways that are going to separate you from others and create uh, not just loyal customers, but people that rave about you and tell everybody they possibly can about how great you are. It's just the little things you can do that would set yourself apart. All right, man. Awesome, awesome. Well, I appreciate you throwing down the challenges and the book recommendation this week. Uh, so now let's let's uh, talk about you for a little bit, man. So can you tell us your background and what you're doing now? Yeah, so uh, I am a doctor of physical therapy. I work in Charlotte, North Carolina. Prior to physical therapy, I was able to work in strength and conditioning. So I got to spend uh, about two years as a student assistant at UNC Chapel Hill and two years coaching uh, strength and conditioning at a Charlotte area high school, then got to go to PT school. And I'm very fortunate right now to be able to kind of combine the physical therapy world with the strength and conditioning world and do things like teach athletes this reach, roll, and lift test that we talked about earlier uh, that'll that'll help them identify those chinks in their armor that that are going to limit their performance and maybe open them up to some injuries. I also teach for Owens Recovery Science, where we teach rehab professionals how to implement blood flow restriction training with their athletes that they're rehabbing. Uh, And then I also teach some courses on uh, better managing the fitness athletes. So take my experiences working with CrossFit Games athletes, elite Olympic lifters, elite power lifters, and and help other rehab professionals learn how to provide top-notch care to those individuals. All right, man. That's and you have a uh, quite a lot oh. of. Ex- oh, go ahead. The barbellphysio dot com. <laughs> yeah, we, we should probably mention that too, right? <laughs> yeah, I forgot the the big one, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that that's kind of the home center. Yeah, where man. I write all my stuff. So you got a lot going on. Um, between it seems like you're helping at every level. You're helping the athlete, and then you're helping also uh, other you know physical therapists become better physical therapists, right? Like uh, yeah, and, and, co- and coaches be be better coaches. Uh, so what do you think, you know, what do you see as like one of the biggest issues, um, in physical therapy right now, maybe since you are at that level of helping other physical therapists become better, what do you see? Not necessarily what's wrong with them in a negative sense, but like Mm. maybe something that could, could be improved or something that you see missing in the physical therapy world right now. Under prescription of rehab. So when does an injury happen? An injury typically happens when the demands that we place on a muscle, on a joint, on a ligament, whatever soft tissue structure it is, exceeds what your body can recover from. So if you run so much that your bones can't keep up with that amount of impact, you get a stress fracture. If you lift so much or, or produce so much force through your hamstring that your hamstring gets a slight tear in it, the capacity, the demands you put on it exceeded its capacity. So our job in rehab is to take you from where you're hurt and build you back up to your athletic performance levels. And so often we're doing, you know, little tiny exercises with TheraBands, very light, never actually getting to loads heavy enough to create changes in the soft tissue. So if you want to get stronger, you have to load a muscle. So if you're if you're going to PT and you have a two pound weight and you're sitting on your side and doing two pound external rotations, for somebody as fit as you, Jared, or most of your listeners, two pound external rotations isn't going to create any sort of adaptive change that's ever going to get you back to overhead pressing 200 pounds, right? Or you know doing Murph again when your shoulders tweaked, there's no way you're doing that from a two pound external rotation. So as a whole, the the rehab community needs needs to do a much better job of understanding the exercise principles that the strength and conditioning world has, has given us and then implementing those with our patients. 
you know, and I see that because I have been to physical therapy before, um, and I, maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a product of the the clients you get because I know when I was uh, it was in Florida at the time when I was doing physical therapy and there was like me and like one other guy who you know I'd consider an athlete so like two athletes and then you know the rest of the people you I'd say the other seventy percent the and I'll say everyone else is kind of in the middle but the other seventy percent were much elderly people you know like uh, way way further on the spectrum very far from their athletic prime uh, do you think that that it, is that what you see primarily? Like, is, I, I know you work with a lot of athletes, but do you see a lot of uh, elderly people coming in? And maybe that's why the shift to just everyone kind of gets the same treatment. Is that where that comes from? Um, it, it, it comes from a lot of things. Um, I'd say that's definitely one of the big ones is, is the clientele you work with is going to really shift the treatments that you use. So if your primary population is over 55 and not active, then when somebody like you or I come into the door, that person isn't used to the loading demands needed for what you and I do and what your listeners do. Right. So if you live in an area where it's possible to search around and find that healthcare provider that, that understands the movement demands that you have and treats people that way, then, then that's going to be your best bet. And then there's also, you know, some laziness and some lack of, continuing education progressions from some people. But I think the biggest one, like you said, is just the clientele people already work with. So if you can find somebody that works with what you've got or or who you are, similar people to who you are, then find that person to see. Well, I have another question for you. See, because you're talking about rehab and I know in in my programming, because I program for a lot of athletes, I always try my best to build in some sort of prehabilitation, you know, working on stabilization or, you know, not always going for the max load and everything, things that are just going to kind of build the the athlete up in the best way possible to injury proof them to a certain degree. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you see um, as some like maybe you can list one to three good injury proofing measures? Because I know there are a lot of problems with people with low back, shoulder issues, things like that. Uh, so what do you see in your practice is, is a great way to prehab or injury proof an athlete to the best of your ability? Uh, slow, steady progressions. So think of training as, as long-term development too often. We want to, uh, go for the home run right away. We want to hit a PR every single week Well, you can do a much better job of planning long-term progressions. If you take things a little bit slower, we see a lot of people that'll, you know, you, you start a squat program and you're, you're trying to PR your three RM every single week for four weeks, right? And maybe you do it for a few, the first few weeks and then your form has to get really sloppy. Well, what if instead we, we take a progression of, uh, we're going to start with a month of eights, a month of fives, a month of threes, continually doing things that slowly build our capacity to increase that load while not continually, uh, overrunning ourselves. And if you look at the training of most really elite guys, take West side barbell as an example, they set out to break a a record every week by five pounds, which doesn't sound like much to most people. And they only do each, each of their max effort lifts once a month. So you're asking, you know, somebody to increase their squat by five pounds every month. That sounds like nothing, but over the course of the year, that's 60 pounds. And how many people can, can really say that, that they've continually added 60 pounds to their lifts every single year. Most people would be happy adding 60 pounds to their squat in a year yeah. if they've been training for longer than a couple of years. Right. But a lot of times that, that slow progression is what's going to keep you safer and allow you to perform better long term. Five, three, one's another great example of a program that does that where they try to increase like five to 10 pounds every, every cycle, I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. And looking at fitness as this uh, long-term approach, you know, this is a conversation I've been having uh, with a lot of people uh, lately is just, yeah, everyone wants to swing for the fences and, and go for the, the PRs. And I'm all about that and the from time to time, you know. But, like, uh, if you are trying to hit a PR every week, uh, that's it's going to get uh, pretty taxing and probably yeah. not, not have you where you want to be as an athlete. Probably seeing you visiting your office a little bit too much <laughs> if you're going for a, <laughs> for a PR every week. Um, um, maybe I should tell people to PR every week. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing here? We're getting too much prehab talk, right? 
All right, man. So I do want to ask a specific question because uh, I follow you on Instagram. You 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 provide a lot of great informational content and and stuff. Uh, anyone listening, go follow him. What's your what's your handle on it? Is it Barbell Physio or the Barbell Physio? The Barbell Physio. The Barbell Physio on Instagram. He's got a lot of great stuff. But one thing I see you doing quite frequently, um, and I'm not trying to plug a product or anything, but it's, I just see you using it very often. Is the yoke? Um, that's what it's yeah. called, right? And not like. Not the yoke. Uh, if anyone anyone listening, like uh, like I have a yoke in my garage, like this massive thing from Rogue Fitness that weighs like 250 pounds that I can load with weight. But it's like this wooden apparatus, right? That's like really meant for like st- stabilization and stuff. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and, and what you're using it for? Yeah. So the yoke is this like I think it's like five pound wooden apparatus and it's curved. So it's really light and then you hang weights from it or you hang it from uh, something overhead. It just it's a tool that gives you a wide variety of different applications, most of which revolve around stability. Um, to me, it is it, it makes some great accessory work. You know, there it, it's not going to that's not going to build your 500 pound squat. The barbell is going to build that 500 pound squat. But this is one of those things that can provide you a very unique training stimulus at times. So, for example, I think the, the probably the latest video you saw was me doing a bench press with it. Yeah. So, because it's curved, it makes you go through a really wide range of motion. So, you actually have to go really, really deep. And then the weights are hanging from this bar. And the bar is very light. The weight's much heavier. So, that makes it more unstable than a lot of the other uh, stability training stuff I've used in the past. I, I, I do a lot of like bench press with, with kettlebells hanging from bands. But because the barbell is heavy... And then you have bands hanging off. It actually makes it a little easier than using this really light yoke bar with the the weights hanging from it. So it's it's just uh, really cool to use in a lot of different ways, from increasing the range of motion of certain lifts to the stability stability demands of different lifts. It's it's just unique to everything else that I've ever worked with. So and and I, I begs the question of stability in general because I know you know that's an easy answer for you, but I would like to you know maybe uh, let the listeners in on a little bit more of why do you find stability work so important and that and you want it to be a part of your program? Uh, it the, the reason the what I how I look at like that stability bench press there is I don't look at it necessarily as as I need to train that level of stability, but when the weights are hanging that much, the amount of neuromuscular stimulus I'm getting is, is very intense. It ends up just being a great muscular workout. Do you need to be able to stabilize you know, an 80-pound stability bench press there to have a stronger bench press? No. But it is uh, just a different way of taxing my muscles. Now, are there certain times like the uh, – I did an overhead walk. I posted a video of that a couple of days ago where I'm walking with it overhead, that is really cool in that it just provides an incredibly challenging stimulus to my core stabilizers and hips as I'm moving around. Do I necessarily need that intense level of stability? No. It's just to me, it's it's a way to make those muscles work harder. It's not like it's functional. Like when is stuff ever that unstable in life for athletics? Yeah, that's when things can get... Uh... But, it's very, but it's very difficult muscular-wise. So let's start like on a level of say beginner to more advanced, uh, someone wanting to get started with stability work. Uh, where would you recommend they start? Is it okay to start with a yoke or is there an easier exercise that people could, uh, could go with? Oh yeah. It's okay too. Cause it has uh, multiple progressions as far as how wide the weights are set away from you, which will make it more unstable or lighter weights or how far down they hang. But if, I mean, if you want to keep it really simple, uh, walk with a kettlebell overhead. Perfect. Yeah. Put the kettlebell upside down, <clears throat> things like that. Just start adding in carries are the simplest way to start working on stability work. Just working on maintaining an upright posture and walking with weight on one side of your body or different size weights in different positions. Yeah, stability well, work doesn't have to be fancy. Yeah, there was a strength and conditioning coach uh, when I was in AFSOC who every, every time I trained with him, he'd make me do a bottoms up kettlebell presses like uh either laying on the ground or standing up and and that was just how we started like every every single exercise session and he i mean he absolutely loved that exercise and and that makes you dial your form down so fast yeah i really like bottoms up kettlebell press like if i'm working form i don't look at the stability bench press with the yoke as a as necessarily a form fixer sometimes it can be like if we're doing pull-ups and i'm 
stronger on one side than the other and I'm pulling harder with my right side than my left, it's going to throw me off. But the bottoms up stuff, if you don't hit the right positions with the bottoms up kettlebell, you're going to lose it really fast. Right. Yeah. So that that's a good way to really work on dialing in your positions and owning every position of a movement. Awesome, man. Well, I want to hit on another topic that uh, you mentioned in your introduction there, uh, blood flow restriction training. Uh, yeah. And to be honest, I'm just going to kind of open this up. I've been getting a lot of questions from uh, the, the garage gym athletes in my program, uh, people wondering about it. Uh, and I know you know a lot about it. And to be honest, it's gaining a lot of popularity. So one, can you ex- kind of explain what it is for the listeners who might not know what blood flow restriction training is? Um, and then we will just go from there, maybe the benefits and why someone might want to do it. Okay. So uh, a lot of recent medical advances have basically led to a lot of military combat vets surviving things that they would not have previously survived. So we have a lot worse injuries coming back from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, they developed a, a place called the Center for the Intrepid out in San Antonio, Texas, which is a, a, an incredible military rehab facility. And so we got all these guys coming back with uh, what we call volumetric muscle loss. So say they took an RPG to the thigh, they lost a huge chunk of their quad. They go there, they start working with physical therapy, trying to get stronger, regain their function. Well, they did some studies on, on how well their rehab was going. And two years out from injuries, the number of at, uh, of combat vets that were getting an amputation two years after their injury was ridiculously high, like embarrassingly high. And so uh, the guy that I work for at Owens Recovery Science, they basically said, all right, well, what we're doing from a rehab perspective isn't working. Even though we're following standard rehab protocols, we're not able to build these guys' work capacity back up to the point where they're functional, pain-free like they should be. So they're living, but they're not living with the quality of life that they deserve as veterans that have, you know, uh, uh, given a lot to their country. So they ended up running into a small bit of research that there was on blood flow restriction training. And from there, they started implementing it with combat vets and it just blew up. It was having amazing results. So typically when we're trying to build strength and muscle mass, we need to load between upwards of 70% of an individual's one rep max. So if you squat 200 pounds, if you want to build leg strength and size, you need to be squatting 140 pounds or more. Well, when these guys come back with these really bad injuries, they couldn't get loaded heavy enough to get to uh, that strength and hypertrophy loading parameters. But with blood flow restriction, rather than needing to load at 70% of an individual one rep max, they can load as light as 20% of a one rep max and get significant gains in strength and muscle mass. So that obviously has a huge effect when it comes to rehab, when we can't load muscles, joints, ligaments, tendons as heavy as we can in a healthy person, we can start to get them moving better and stronger and take care of that underloading that we discussed earlier. So how do we do blood flow restriction training? Well, we've got these specialized tourniquets that restrict the amount of blood flow that comes into a limb. So we'll we'll place this tourniquet either on the upper arm or the upper thigh. It's kind of the only two places you ever want to put it because anywhere else there's risk of damaging nerves. Don't want to damage nerves. Nerves are really hard to to regrow. So upper arm, upper thigh, and it partially occludes how much blood flow comes in and then no blood flow comes out. So if we put the muscle in a state where it's not getting as much blood flow, it's not getting as much oxygen. So with these really light loads, we're able to get into what's called anaerobic metabolism, our fast twitch muscle fibers. Those fast twitch muscle fibers are typically only recruited when we lift really heavy. So now at really light loads, we're recruiting fast twitch muscle fibers, which what happens when you lift heavy? You get the muscle burn, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So that muscle burn is a combination of lactic acid and hydrogen ions and different waste products that are produced. When we're in anaerobic metabolism with blood flow restriction training, we get this giant buildup of lactic acid. And then with the tourniquet on, we don't actually let the lactic acid get removed. Your body removes lactic acid very fast because it's very sensitive to it. So if we do several sets of an exercise with blood flow restriction, these lactic acid levels build up incredibly high 
to the point where your body thinks, holy crap, we just did a ridiculously tough workout, really, really heavy. We need to repair and rebuild. And so it changes some hormone expression stuff. It changes levels uh, of growth hormone, IGF-1, the, the gene myostatin. We don't need to go down the road of all that crazy science, but it basically puts you in a state where you're going to build muscle mass back or build muscle mass even at really, really light loads. And, and that's what I think is really fascinating is like, the yeah, I see these guys, yeah, using the pink weights uh, with, with uh, these these tourniquets on. And, it, you know, all the research is, is backing it up. So it seems like a really proven method. Uh, but you mentioned one there, potential uh, nerve damage if you, if you put it in the wrong spot. But is there, are there any other uh, cons to blood flow restriction training that you can see, think of, or maybe had experience with? Anytime, if, if the blood flow cuff is too tight or has too much pressure to restrict, you can damage uh, stuff underneath. You can damage arteries, vessels, muscles, nerves. So it's really important to not have this on too tight or have too narrow of a cuff. There's been a lot of research. Unfortunately, there's several people out there that are promoting these really, really small blood flow restriction cuffs. Yeah. They're about one inch wide. And uh, the amount of pressure that it takes to occlude blood flow when it's that thin versus something that's wider is significantly higher. And if you if it, you have more pressure, then you're going to uh, risk the damage of, of underlying soft tissue. So you want a little bit of a wider cuff than a narrow one. Um, as far as other stuff goes, like we've had a lot of concern about blood clots. And we actually see release of multiple blood clotting, uh, anti-blood clotting agents with blood flow restriction training. We've got multiple studies that show that it's safe from that perspective. From a cardiovascular perspective, your your cardiovascular system's response to blood flow restriction training is actually lower than that of high intensity training. So if you can go lift heavy weights, then then pretty much if you can lift heavy weights and you would be cleared by a surgeon to undergo surgery where they put you on a tourniquet for hours then you're safe to do blood flow restriction is the, the two general r rules there. Okay. And so let me just get your, your personal thoughts on it. Uh, you know, maybe I'm a little old school and sometimes I see, see things like this pop up and I'm like, ah, you know, I would rather just get under a heavy barbell and, and do it that way. Uh, but what are your thoughts on it, man? Do you think that, uh, say garage gym athletes and, and people doing minimalist training should, should invest in some of these tourniquets and start adding it to their, their routine? Good question. Um, so yeah, if you just listen to what I said, it sounds like, all right, here's another stupid fad that is not at all proven. So blood flow restriction training as of right now has 160 peer reviewed studies and many more coming out every single week. Um, multiple, what we call systematic reviews and meta analysis. So basically there's no denying the fact that it creates strength and hypertrophy gains. Right now I like to say that that 90% of its application is to the rehab world where we can't load muscles and tendons and joints as much because something's recovering. 10% is for the garage gym athlete or the athlete that wants to create some specific training adaptations. Now, are you going to go win a powerlifting competition or the CrossFit games or whatever by doing blood flow restriction training? No, that is not, that is not a big chunk of your training, but blood flow restriction training does not create muscle protein breakdown. So typically when we lift heavy to create hypertrophy gains, we break down the muscle and the body builds it up and that's its response. And so that's why you get that delayed onset muscle soreness with blood flow restriction training. You don't do that. So there are times where you may want to bring up a weak body part, but you, you can't add in more heavy training. That's a good way to do it. Or you just want to, you know, you want some added hypertrophy work on your triceps. And that's if what I probably to, see to, the, the, the biggest application in all honesty is anytime you, uh, and, and I don't think it's like a, a bad fad necessarily. I'm, I'm very curious into, into just to see where it, where it goes. I'm normally, uh, later to hop onto these things. Um, but always interested in learning more about them. But yeah, I think if you just want to build some muscle and you don't like add that to your routine, you know, like mm -hmm. if, if you wanted to, yeah, you, like you were just saying, your triceps are you know, not as big as you want. You want to add a little bit more muscle growth there or somewhere else. Um, I, that's what, you know, I could see it really being a very simple thing to add to your, your already good training routine. Yeah. It, it's the, 
it's the you know you have a cupcake you got icing on it it's the sprinkles on top of the icing on top of the cupcake right it's it's that last little bit that may have a good effect specific to your goals it also has some cool applications um there have been a number of studies on endurance training that show that it increases vo2 max decreases runtime and that's not just in like that's not in grandma they've done studies on division two basketball players they've done uh one study has been presented at a conference it hasn't been published yet but it's on uh para jumpers pjs mm-hmm. i know you know who pjs are but for yeah. those that don't pjs are are special operations medics yeah so they are incredibly highly trained they walked with blood flow restriction training on just walked with it for 15 minutes, I think they did like 12 sessions, and their mile and a half runtime decreased, VO2 max increased. That's incredible, man. Because, like you're saying, uh, so the the Air Force PT test is 1.5 mile run, and these guys are already running it damn near as fast as you probably could think of. And if their times are going down, that's very interesting, man. I haven't. I've read some studies on the the strength and hypertrophy work. I haven't read any just because I I haven't been looking for it um, on endurance vo2 max things like that that's amazing man so what they're primarily they they just throw them on and do walking or or continued endurance training how does that look they do uh, most of the studies have been on walking or cycling so they typically most studies have done 12 sessions of blood flow restriction for a total of 15 minutes occlusion in each session so they would put the cuff on and either do like three five minute rounds or one 15 minute round of just walking or cycling that's Some cool. studies have done those 12 sessions over the course of two weeks. Some have done it over the course of six weeks. It doesn't really seem like it matters as much as just get 12 sessions in with it. And that seems to be where it, where it has a good effect. But, yeah, all they're doing is biking or cycling. That is very – Walking or cycling. That's very cool, man. I think I, I definitely want to want to learn more about that. Um, is there – uh, you know, a particular brand that you recommend or something? Because as this does explode – see, the only issues I see with – stuff like this and i know you you'd probably agree is like because you just said it's the it's the sprinkles on top of the cupcake you know it's not the whole thing is like some entrepreneur is going to blow this out to where uh yeah this is the only thing that you need in your life to be the fittest person on the planet so just order this for three payments of whatever and and we'll ship it to your house and you'll be uh, yeah the next uh CrossFit yeah. games athlete or something. That's that's the only issue I see with it. I think using it as you're saying, I think is perfectly fine. Uh, but like, I guess where do you see the the direction or best application um, for the less advanced athlete? Do you think that they should be using, it or should you already have a a really good training routine? Uh, no question, down. You should already have a really really good training routine down before you even consider adding this in you need to have everything else kind of dialed in because that's what's going to give you the absolute must bang for your buck but if you just have those specific points you, you want to hit that's fine uh you mentioned how to do it like device wise yeah um, I wonder, yeah and if you have like a particular uh <coughs> device in mind or that you recommend because you said the ones that like with really small like inch wide ones are like basically dangerous right so yeah yeah so the, uh, there are like three different levels of blood flow restriction training device if you're a medical professional The FDA regulates tourniquets as anything that partially or fully occludes blood flow. So if you're a PT or a DC, an AT, an MD, and you're listening to this, you only have one option if you want to perform this safely and legally on your patients, and that's uh, the Delphi personal tourniquet system. Uh, That's the only FDA-approved device. Um, If you're a recreational athlete, you want to use this on yourself, there are many different things that you can use. You can grab your standard compression wraps, your voodoo bands, and you can wrap up with that. And if you're wrapping your legs, usually about a seven out of 10 as far as how much pressure you feel underneath it. If you're wrapping your arms, usually about a five out of 10. If you start to get any crazy numbness, or tingling going on, then go ahead and pop that off right away because that just means you're, uh, you hadn't damaged the nerve if it's just starting, but it's just you don't want to continue to keep that on for a long period of time. Um, and then there's several commercial products out there now. There's one called the Occlusion Cuff. There's a Be Strong Band. Um, just make sure it's one of the ones that's a little bit wider. Okay. You don't want it to be like one or two inches wide. That's going to require too much pressure underneath it to, I believe, safely occlude blood flow without risking damaging soft tissues. I wrote an article called The Best Blood Flow Restriction Training Devices, too, that kind of summarizes all of that. 
Yeah, man, I'll link to anything you got on blood flow, blood, blood flow restriction training because I know a lot of people are going to be interested in it. I'm sitting here picking your ga- your brain because I am super interested, and I like especially that with that endurance stuff. I'm gonna have to to read up on that. I think that's amazing, uh, but I do want to know like so I would be very comfortable like having you uh, you know prescribe this like blood flow restriction training for me and like kind of walking me through it and and everything. Mm-hmm. But it does seem like a little bit scary, uh, and maybe it's just my background when I hear the word tourniquet. Uh, in the military, tourniquet was like the last resort, you know, in life-saving care. Obviously, it's a different type of uh, tourniquet, but we, I was always like taught to be afraid of those, basically, because of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, you know. So, like, should I have a little bit of fear in trying to prescribe this myself? Should I do it with a professional first? Like, what what should kind of the, the route be there? If you follow the guideline, like if you go to my website and you read up on blood flow restriction training, you read all the articles that I have there, you follow the guidelines as far as where to place it, the proximal thigh, pro- upper thigh, upper arm, you make the cuff or whatever you're using to occlude blood flow be a little bit wider uh, so that it covers probably at least a quarter to a third of the extremity. Um, if you don't put too much pressure down, then the safety of it, it it's safe. Okay. Are there some risks? Yes, there are. There are probably just as many risk as doing heavy back squats. Yeah, I was about to say, you got just as much risk. Uh... If, if you're following those guidelines. Now, if you're going and you're, you're taking that one-inch cuff that they sell on Amazon and you're cranking it down as hard as you can and putting it in the wrong place, then, yeah, you can create some significant problems. There have been a couple case studies of people who put it on their uh, upper calf. You have a very, very superficial nerve up there, and they ended up killing the nerve, and they ended up with what's called foot drop where they can't lift their toes up as they walk. So they're kind of tripping over their toes or yeah. having to walk funny. So you do need to be careful. You do need to do your, your research before you start implementing. But as long as you follow those basics there, then you're going to be safe. All right, man. And I just wanted to go over that uh, just because a lot of people are going to listen to this and probably, like you said, they would hop on Amazon, find the cheapest one, and then next thing you know, uh, they hurt themselves. So thanks for uh, giving us the, the in-depth uh, tutorial there and we'll I will link to all the information I, on your site because I know that you have spent a lot of time in research in this area uh, and I'll make sure that all my listeners uh, have access to that stuff all right man I'm going to switch gears on you to our book question um, so say there's a nationwide curriculum implemented and the president calls you up and he says you are responsible for one chapter of this book and so every single child in America will have to read your chapter and be tested on and pass before they can graduate high school. So given the weight or magnitude of that uh, task, what would your chapter be about? My chapter would probably be on finances, actually. I think just not enough people, this has nothing to do with me as a business or anything like that. It's just my opinion. I think not enough people understand uh, how to truly live a life uh, where they're financially secure and they're going to be able to take care of themselves and their family even if something bad pops up. I understand that there are definitely times where, where, and I have been there myself, where you don't have, you know, you, you can't always have 5K in the bank for when an emergency happens. I've been broke before that happens, but I wish more people understood basics of finances and how to plan out and budget and work on <clears throat> living debt-free lives and not be slaves to the credit card. That's awesome, man, and I, I completely agree. So my wife and I, we were... Yeah, we were $100,000 in debt when we first got married between student loans and our cars and all this other stuff. I was like, how does how does this even happen? Like, you hear about someone who's $100,000 in debt, like, their life is, like, massively out of order. And I was like, all we did was go- we went to school and we, we got a car. Both of us got a car. Like, how, yeah. <laughs> how did this happen? Uh, but we worked really hard um, and got out of debt. Um, we followed uh, the Dave Ramsey method there to to pay off all of our debt um do you have any like resources or anything that you'd recommend for people uh doing finances or or anything yeah. in general dave ramsey would be it for me too i mean i i've been a pt for four years my wife just graduated from pharmacy school so we have a ton of student loans but we're we're just going at it with the dave ramsey mindset where we budget at the start of every month we know what we're going to spend uh, you know, being a pharmacist and a physical therapist, we make very good money. But if you look at our house and how we live, you don't see us living like what we have financially because we we believe very much in that Ramsey approach of we're going to spend a couple years, we're going to suck it up and not live like our friends are. And in two years, we're going to be 100% debt free. And, and then we're going to be actually creating long-term wealth rather than uh, 
what would I consider to be fake wealth if I was living better right now and just dragging my loans out? I'm not actually being wealthy. I'm just looking like I'm wealthy. But in a couple of years, I'll be able to actually develop that long-term wealth and financial stabilization forever. That's great, man. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really cool. Um uh, that'd be an awesome chapter, and I do agree with you 100%. I don't think that that's focused on enough anywhere in the entire world. It's not like, oh, America's doing it wrong. I don't think any any country's doing it right. They don't really, uh, you know, teach just like budget 101. Like, yeah, there, there's something I think it was Ramsey that said it, but he's like, look at your house and then go look at you know the, the a picture of Visa headquarters, which is more impressive. <laughs> right. Visa is so you're you're never going to outsmart the credit card company and and make more money off them than they are off of you. Yeah, and that's what, and it it comes down to discipline. You know, a lot of people everyone thinks that they have enough discipline to just pay it off every month, but then something slides and like, you know, it just I don't know. It always it always ends up going in a bad direction. All right, man. Well, I appreciate that. Uh I think that's that's really cool. Um I do want to ask you a little bit more about physical therapy. Um, and then we'll move into the quick fire questions and then the question of the show, uh, because you work a lot with, uh, you know, strength and conditioning athletes or higher level athletes. Uh, and I just like to ask, because when I have someone on the show who has as much experience, it helps me become uh, a better coach, better programmer. What are some of the things that you see in these, I'd say intermediate to more advanced athletes? What are some of the common problems you're seeing, uh, happen amongst these athletes? Common problems. Uh, Rapid changes in training volume tends to be a, a risk factor for injury. Okay. So if you just randomly decide to start throwing in two extra workouts per week, that's going to lead to problems. So just taking a, a slower, more systematic approach to increasing that would be number one. Uh, number two, I think probably more unilateral work is needed for a lot of people. They just end up developing some side-to-side -side imbalances and never realizing it. Um, and then number three, I'd probably go back again to, to just never analyzing their strengths and weaknesses and taking the time to figure out what's, what's holding them back. Cause what's holding you back performance wise, a lot of times is what's going to still also lead to you getting injured. Awesome, dude. And I think, uh, I think that's great. And I think, you know, kind of the, to paint a, a lot of your, your answers with a, like a broad brush is that, uh, you know, kind of what you're saying is that systematic approach you know to just your training in general is like making sure that you have this long-term plan and that you're not always uh, you know like pushing it to the limit but like having some sort of smart progression in place is probably yeah. the the best way to keep uh, a healthy athlete yep all right man awesome awesome well let's uh let's get to the quick fire questions and then i'll ask the question of the show are you ready yeah all right man so what is the hardest workout you've ever done German volume training, 10 sets of 10 squats. No question about it. That was horrible. GVT is pretty pretty awful, man. That, that's great. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to ask you more questions about that, but I'm going to move, move on to the, the more quick fire questions first. All right. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Consistently working on your weaknesses. Uh, it, it takes a lot. It's very easy to go in the gym, and if you're – I'm a really good front squatter. It's really good for me to go in and do front squats. I hate double unders and burpees. It's really tough right. for me to go in and do workouts that, that require doubles, uh, double unders and burpees. But when I took a two month period and I made sure every week I did workouts with double unders and burpees every single week. And I started out with them being very low level so that they weren't super stressful. Cause typically when those were in a workout, they stressed me out and I got like physically stressed prior to the workout. I started out low and systematically over two months built them up. Now they no longer stress me out when I get to the workout. They're, they're no longer like a complete energy zapper in the middle of a Metcon workout because I consistently worked on them. You know, what's funny is um, when I first like was kind of getting into more CrossFit style training many years ago, I like a lot of people, like most people, I'd say I sucked at double unders. Um, and so I, what I did to just to illustrate your point for the listeners is I, I would lock myself in a racquetball court with a jump rope and I would do that. Uh, a lot of people probably heard of the workout. So it's 
10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10 of double unders. Uh, and I, I was just at the point to where I could I could get to that level, but it took me forever. Uh, so, But you have to do them. Like, so it has to be 10 unbroken, take a break. 20 unbroken, take a break. And if you don't get that unbroken, you have to repeat it. So like if I'm on my way to 50 and I trip up on 43, then I got to go again until I get up to 50. Uh, and so uh, this was pre-kids, pre-being married. So I had a lot of time on my hands. Um, but I, I think I would spend like an hour or two in the racquetball court just completing that workout. Now that's a workout I can probably complete in like less than 10 minutes. But back in the day, it took me forever. Uh, so just to illustrate your point, or for anyone who might be struggling with something like that, just pounding away at your weaknesses for a long period of time it's gonna suck but then like like right now like double unders i don't even really ever practice them that much they just become naturally because i spent so much time um in the beginning making sure i knew how to do those uh so i i, I love that answer man all right if you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life what would it be is that even a question with me jared <laughs> the barbell physio it, it's a barbell all right, awesome. Well, all day. I'm seeing that yoke a lot, man. I, so I have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> it's a barbell. All right, man. Uh, all right, so this is the question of the show, man. What is your best advice you have for becoming a better human? And this is 100% open ended. Yeah, um, something that I am very, very passionate about and try to tell anybody that'll listen to me is to write down your life's vision statement of, of who you want to be uh, as a from a business perspective, as a member of your family, religiously, whatever you want, put it in there, write it down and keep it with you always. Um, I have my vision statement with me, with me every single day. Uh, your vision statement can change over time, but um, I think when you have that with you all the time, it's going to keep you more focused. You're going to start to really align yourselves with people that are going to help you maintain that vision. Um, it's going to keep you focused and uh, on things that are going to help you reach that vision. For instance, you'll get little side opportunities that are good opportunities, but they're not going to get you to where you want to be five years from now. And you, if you just always have that vision statement with you and in the back of your mind, it's going to keep you always doing things that are going to long term get you to where you feel like you're being called to go. Awesome, man. And I love that. I think uh, I, I have the, the same thing. I try and look at it every single day. Um, and I, I think it's a great uh compass or gps to have so i think that's a great yep. answer man i appreciate that all right man so i'm sure we're already going to link to a lot of the articles because i know everyone's probably just like uh their heads are spinning from blood flow restriction training information but uh where should people go to learn more about you find out you know what you're doing online and, and all that other stuff uh facebook and instagram are the barbell physio but I'd really encourage people more. You can go there and you're going to see a bunch of random exercises that look cool. But where you're going to learn about the implementation of those and the system and taking the systemized approach that we've talked about to implement implementation of that is, is going to be the barbellphysio.com. So I post all those videos on my social media, but the articles on the barbellphysio.com is where you really learn and how to implement those so that you're a better athlete, healthier athlete, rather than just picking random exercises that look cool because they're on Instagram. Right. <laughs> all right. Perfect, man. Well, you heard it, guys. Go check out all of his stuff, the Barbell Physio. He has a lot of great information. He's a really great gr guy, and I can't uh, endorse his stuff more. If you need to learn about this stuff, definitely check out everything he's got going on. Zach, I really appreciate your time today, man. Thanks for being on the podcast. I uh, appreciate you having me, man. It's a lot of fun.
your best. Losers always whine about their best. 